Morning, everybody. Good morning. Good to be back here in the vacancy and help out. I've seen him down for several Sundays, so looking forward to that. There's a lot of notices, so I won't read them out, but you've got to list them anyway, at the, uh, so I'm told. And there's a couple of just important announcements to emphasise. There's a safeguarding trust meeting on Tuesday evening at a half past seven. And then there's a beetle drive on Friday evening at eight o'clock. And during the service too, we have to remember people who are ill and uh, there's Francis, Jennifer, Christopher, and we pray for them and for healing for them and for their friends who are concerned about them in the service. We begin our worship this morning with a well-known hymn, uh, God is here as we as people meet to offer praise and prayer.
Turning to page three of the Holy Communion, uh, well, you don't have it uh, unless you go on the screen. We say the colic for purity together, Almighty God. Almighty God, to whom all hearts are open, all desires known, from whom no secrets are hidden, cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of your Holy Spirit, that we may perfectly love you and worthy magnify your holy name through Christ our Lord. Amen. God so loved the world that he gave his only Son, Jesus Christ, to save us from our sins, to intercede for us in heaven, and to bring us to eternal life. Now therefore let us affirm our trust in God's mercy and confess that we need forgiveness. Father, you come to meet us when we return to you. Lord, have mercy. Lord, have mercy. Jesus, you died on the cross for our sins. Christ, have mercy. Christ, have mercy. Holy Spirit, you give us life and peace. Lord, have mercy. Lord, have mercy. The collect for the second Sunday before Advent. Heavenly Father, whose blessed Son, Jesus Christ, was revealed to destroy the works of the devil and to make us the children of God and heirs of eternal life. Grant that we, having this hope, may purify ourselves even as he is pure. And when we shall appear in power and great glory, we may be like him in his eternal and glorious kingdom, where he is alive and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. We be seated now, and a member of the congregation will read the, the epistle for today. The reading is taken from 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verses 23 to 29. For I received from the Lord what I also passed on to you. The Lord Jesus, on the night he was betrayed, took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, after supper, he took the cup, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this whenever you drink it, in remembrance of me. For whenever you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. So then, whoever eats the bread or drinks the cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner will be guilty of sinning against the body and the blood of the Lord. Everyone ought to examine themselves before they eat of the bread and drink from the cup. For those who eat and drink without discerning the body of Christ, eat and drink judgment on themselves. This is the word of the Lord. The Holy Gospel is written in the Gospel according to St. Luke um, in the 22nd chapter beginning at the 14th verse. Glory be to thee, O Lord. When the hour came, Jesus and his apostles reclined at the table, and he said to them, I have eagerly desired to eat this Passover with you before I suffer, for I tell you, I will not eat it again until it finds fulfillment in the kingdom of God. After taking the cup, he gave thanks and said, Take this and divide it among you, for I tell you, I will not drink again from the fruit of the vine until the kingdom of God comes. And he took bread, he gave thanks and broke it and gave it to them, saying, This is my body given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, after supper, he took the cup, saying, This cup is a new covenant in my blood, which is poured out for you, but the hand of him who is going to betray me is with me on the table. 
The Son of Man will go as it was been decreed, but woe to the man who betrays him. And they began to question among themselves which of them it might be who would do this. This is the Gospel of the Lord. We'll now sing another hymn, hymn number 423, Jesus our Master on the night that they came. May the words of my lips and the meditations of all our hearts be always acceptable in thy sight, O Lord, our strength and our Redeemer. Amen. Luke 22, chapter 22, verse 14. Do this in remembrance of me. Some time ago, an English clergyman doing some research and he wrote an article in the paper it was entitled, Holy Communion on the Moon. It seems that the astronauts then, that's back about 45 years ago, nearly 50 years ago now, I suppose, Neil Armstrong and Buzz Aldrin asked for mission control for silence when they celebrated Holy Communion, which was prepared for them by their church back at home. So therefore, the first bread eat on the moon was a, and the first wine drank was the elements of the Holy Communion. Now really what these two men were sending out was a very important message. And it was that modern science, modern technology, and indeed high education, and the Christian faith need not necessarily be in opposition to each other. For here were two men who were at the very cutting edge of modern science and modern technology. Both, of course, were very brainy people, highly educated, and yet they believed in God and were active church members. In fact, one of them was a Sunday school teacher. Modern science tells us how God made the world. The Bible tells us why we are here. And there are many scientists and educated people who are committed Christians and involved in their churches. A different article in the paper at about the same time was headed, A Table Divided. 
And the article said this. So back at the time Tony Blair was Prime Minister. So at last it's official. Tony Blair can take communion with his wife Cherry and his family. Why? Because a new rule made by the Pope that time, and it hasn't been changed as far as I know, forbid Protestants like Tony Blair from taking communion with Catholics uh, like his wife and his family. The Prime Minister at that time, not too sure about now, was a committed member of the Church of England. And he still went to Catholic Mass with his wife and family. And funny enough, back in 1996, the then Roman Catholic the Cardinal, a man called Cardinal Basil Hume, wrote to him and asked him would he mind stopping doing that because he was embarrassing the priests who weren't able to give him communion. In his reply, and hope he still would say the same, Tony Blair said, I wonder what Jesus would have made of all this. A good point. And that was underscored when Blair uh, and his wife visited the Pope at the Vatican before the war in Iraq. While his family and wife went for communion with the Pope, the Prime Minister, he was Prime Minister at that time, could only stay at the back and receive a blessing because the Pope's new rule enforces the matter. It explicitly forbids Roman Catholics and Protestants from taking communion together in a Catholic church because according to their teaching, and it's still the same, Though some priests will quietly ignore that rule, I understand, if only those in full communion with the Catholic Church can take part in uh, the Holy Communion. And the, the rule which was issued during Holy Week in the Pope's audience in St. Peter's Square stated that the Roman Catholic Church would outlaw abuses of the Holy Communion, including its celebration by Catholics and non-Catholics in a common act of worship. And an editor, John Wilkin, of the Catholic newspaper, the tablet at that time, they were more modern, more liberal, and they were critical. And they summed it up like this. The Pope was worried because the point is that people are voting with their feet. At a local level, there's a lot of, quite a lot of intercommunion, and it is growing. People just do it because they want to. And Rome is worried that it's creeping along the ground much faster than they're getting permission from the top. And indeed in the south of Ireland, in Dublin recently, the Church of Ireland was criticised and castigated for allowing Roman Catholics to take communion at its services. The Protestant um, bishop at that time replied very, and said, I feel again like Tony Blair, I wonder what Jesus would be saying about all this. Now, of course, we all strong, hold strong views about this as people of the Reformed faith. The Catholic interpretation was of what happens at the Holy Communion is certainly very strange and foreign to us. We don't believe in transubstantiation. That was a big, big problem at the Reformation, as you will remember, or in the exclusive way in which the Catholics would treat this sacrament. To us, it is the highest symbol of our unity in Christ and something which transcends church doctrine or ecumenical power play, for that matter. Furthermore, when we take our Bibles and we turn to the New Testament, there we find no less than four separate accounts uh, of the first appointment of the Holy Communion. St. Matthew, St. Mark, St. Luke, as you heard this morning, and St. Paul, as you heard this morning, all four describe it. And all four agree in telling us what our Lord Jesus did on that very memorable night. But only two of them give us the reason why our Lord ordered his disciples to eat this bread and drink this cup. St. Paul and St. Luke both record the remarkable words, do this in remembrance of me. As you remember the reading, Paul adds his own comment, as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, 
you proclaim the Lord's death till he comes. When scripture speaks so plainly, why cannot we not be content with it? Why should we mystify and confuse a subject which the New Testament makes so simple? The continual remembrance of Christ's death was the one grand object for which the Lord's Supper was ordained. And those who go further on this is simply adding to God's word. Furthermore, is it reasonable to suppose that the Lord would appoint an ordinance for the simple purpose of keeping his death in remembrance? Most well, certainly it is. Of all the facts of his earthly ministry, none are as important as that of his death. It is a great satisfaction for our sins, and it was a great atonement of almighty power to which every sacrifice in the Old Testament indicated and pointed and spoke about. Now the next question in the New Testament or the prayer book, or does the New Testament or our book of common prayer warrant anyone in saying that the Lord's Supper was ordained to be a sacrifice and that in it Christ's body and blood are present in some way under the form of forms of bread and wine. And this, of course, is the argument of the Catholic Church. And that is indeed one of the main points that caused the Reformation. First of all, a look at the New Testament. When our Lord said to the disciples, this is my body and this is my blood, he evidently meant that this bread in my hand is a sign or an emblem of my body. And this cup of wine in my hand contains an emblem of my blood. And the disciples were accustomed to hear him say such things in his sermons. They would have remembered him saying, the field is the world, the good seed are the children of the kingdom. It never entered their minds that he meant that he was holding his own body and blood in his hands. And not one of the New Testament writers speak of the sacrament as being a sacrifice or call the Lord's table an altar, or even hint that the Christian minister is a sort of sacrificing priest. The universal doctrine of the New Testament is that after the one offering of Christ on the cross, there is no need for any more sacrifices as such. What then about our Book of Common Prayer? That is the summary of our faith, and we use it every Sunday. Does it warrant anyone in saying that the Lord's Supper was meant to be a sacrifice and that Christ's body and blood are present under the forms of bread and wine? Most certainly not. Not once is the word altar, believe it or not, found in the prayer book in reference to the Holy Table or indeed in the Bible. Not once is the Lord's Supper called a sacrifice. Throughout the communion service, the one ordinance is that is pressed on our attention and our minds is the remembrance of the death of Christ. And that is a very important point. And finally, a word might be said about those who participate in the Lord's Supper. For clergy, including myself, I often hear people saying, I'm not good enough to come to the Holy Communion. Now there is a phrase in the passage that was read this morning which speaks about eating this bread and drinking this wine unworthily. What does this mean? It may mean that the person who comes to the Lord's table unworthily is a person who does not realize what the breads and the symbols of wine stand for and what they mean, and who has no sense of respect for what they are doing, not aware of the obligations involved. Now, as you know, our order of service in our prayer book invites to the Lord's table those who truly and earnestly repent of their sins and who are in love and charity with their neighbours and intend to lead a new life. That is very clear and very simple and a very strong evangelical statement. In other words, the person who is sorry for their sins, who comes in repentance, and in whose heart there is no hatred or bitterness 
of contempt against a brother man or man or people, we must be clear about one thing, that this phrase used by St. Paul, which forbids people eating and drinking unworthily, does not shut out the person who is a sinner and who knows it to be so. An old Scottish minister, seeing a woman hesitate to take the cup, stretched it out to her, saying, Take it, woman, it's for sinners, it's for you and for me. If the Lord's table was reserved for the perfect, then I doubt if any of us could approach it. The holy table is never closed to the penitent sinner, to the person who loves God, who loves their neighbor or fellow man. The table is ever open, and though their sins be as scarlet, they shall be as white as snow. Now, the important thing is, and this is a conclusion, is the attitude of our hearts and whether or not we truly are seeking to honour Jesus Christ. All worship should focus our hearts on God. Although Christians may differ and observe the Lord's Supper in somewhat different ways, they agree that God has given us this celebration to remind us of the death of Christ and it's important or significant for our lives. The scripture says in 1 Corinthians 11, for when you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death till he comes. So whenever you join in the Lord's Supper, simply ask God to remind you in a fresh way his love for you and how his love was demonstrated by Christ's death on the cross. As 1 John 4, 9 sums it up, this is how God showed his love amongst us. He sent his one and only son into the world that we might live through him. This is love, not that we love God, but that he loved us and sent his son to be an atoning sacrifice for our sins. And what better way to end a sermon on that subject is by another very appropriate hymn, Four two three, sorry, um, four two five. Jesus, thou joy of loving hearts, thou fount of life, our lives sustain.
We'll omit the uh, Apostles' Creed this morning. We've covered that well in the sermon. It's a bit long. And we move down to the prayers of the people. Let us pray. Father, we pray for the church worldwide. Grant every member of your church may truly and humbly serve you. We pray for all who govern our whole authority in the nations of the world, and especially in our own country, Northern Ireland. We remember our politicians at this difficult time, when there is a lot of uncertainty, and especially here in our own country. And the two, we, in our prayers, we would remember the situation overseas and our Lord's own country, Israel. We pray for those, both in Israel and Palestine, humble people who are caught up in this world, in this fierce war now. We pray for those who are suffering as a result of terrorism and violence. We remember the situation further too in Ukraine. In some places in the world we remember where Christians are forbidden even to worship and some are suffering terribly for their faith. And therefore we pray for all who govern and hold authority in the nations we uh, have mentioned. And there we may, that there may be justice and peace on this earth. Give rest to do your will and in all we undertake that your glory may proclaim to our lives. And remember, of course, now locally, uh, this group of this parish, especially at the time of vacancy. And we thank God for people who make their talents available uh, each Sunday and during the week. They keep the light of faith burning when there is no pastor. And we pray for God's guidance for the members of the nominators and the select vestry who have uh, major decisions to take and a lot of work to do. We remember them in our prayers. And we pray too for people who are unable to be with us through no fault of their own. We remember again Francis, Jennifer, Christopher. And we pray for healing and we pray for the doctors and nurses who have worked with them. And we thank God for those emergency services. Lord, in your mercy. As we pray for those known to us in need of your touch and silence, we bring to your throne of them to your throne of grace. Stretch, stretch your hand to bring healing to those who are sick, comfort for those who mourn, and to those in despair. Accept our prayers to Jesus Christ, our Lord, who taught us to pray, our Father, our Father who art in heaven. Hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. We do not presume. We do not presume to come to this your table, merciful Lord, trusting in our own righteousness, but in your manifold and great mercies. We are not worthy so much as to gather up the crumbs under your table, but you are the same Lord, whose property is always to have mercy. Grant us, therefore, gracious Lord, so to eat the flesh of your dear Son, Jesus Christ, and to drink his blood that our sinful bodies may be cleaned by his body and our souls washed to his most precious blood, that we may evermore dwell in him and he in us. Amen. The peace of the Lord be always with you. The Offertory Hymn is number 451. We come as guests invited when Jesus bids us dine.
Christ, our Passover, has been sacrificed for us. The Lord is here. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. Let us pray. Lord of all creation, we praise you for your goodness and your love. When we turned away, you did not reject us. You came to meet us in your Son, welcome us as your children, and prepare a table where we might feast with you. In Christ, you shared our life, that we might live in him and he in us. You open life. Lord Jesus Christ, our Redeemer, on the night you died, you came to, to a table with your friends. Taking bread, you broke it and gave it to them, saying, Take, eat, this is my body which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. <laughs> After supper, you also took the cup, and when you had given thanks, you gave it to them, saying, Drink you all of this, for this is my blood of the New Testament, which is shed for you and for many for the remissions of sins. Do this as often as you shall drink it in remembrance of me. Praise to you, Lord Jesus Christ. Holy, Holy Spirit, giver of life, come upon us now. May this bread and wine be to us a remembrance of your sacrifice on the cross and the blood of our Lord Jesus Christ. As we drink and eat these holy gifts. Father, Holy Spirit, blessed Trinity, with your whole church throughout the world, we offer you this sacrifice of thanks and praise. We lift up our voice to join the song of heaven, forever praising you and saying, Holy, 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 Lord, God of power and heaven and earth are your glory. Hosanna Thanks be to you, our God, for your gift beyond words. The bread which we break is a sharing in the body of Christ. We live in many of our own body, but we all share in one bread. Draw near with faith and receive the body, the, the bread and wine, which is an outward and visible sign of the death of Christ on the cross. In it we remember that he died for us. We feed him in him in our hearts by faith with thanksgiving. Body for Lord Jesus The body for Lord Jesus Christ, which is given for you, preserve your body and soul unto everlasting life. Take and eat this in remembrance that Christ died for you, and feed him in your heart by faith with thanksgiving. The body for Lord Jesus Christ, which is given for you, preserve your body and soul unto everlasting life. Take and eat this in remembrance that Christ died for you, and feed him in your heart by faith with thanksgiving. Take and eat this. Take and eat this. Take and eat this in remembrance that Christ died for you and feed him in your heart by faith with thanksgiving. Take and eat this in remembrance that Christ died for you and feed him in your heart by faith with thanksgiving. Take and eat this. Take and eat this in remembrance that Christ died for you and feed him in your heart by faith with thanksgiving.
the blood of our Lord Jesus Christ, which is shed for you, preserve your body and soul unto everlasting life. Drink this in remembrance that Christ's blood was shed for you, and be thankful. Drink this. Drink this in remembrance that Christ's blood was shed for you, and be thankful. Drink this in remembrance that Christ's blood was shed for you, and be thankful. Drink this in remembrance that Christ's blood was shed for you, and be thankful. Drink this in remembrance that Christ's blood was shed for you. Drink this in remembrance that Christ's blood was shed for you, and be thankful. Drink this in remembrance that Christ's blood was shed for you, and be thankful. Drink this in remembrance that Christ's blood was shed for you, and be thankful. Drink this in remembrance that Christ's blood was shed for you, and be thankful.
Is it all right if we sing 433? My God, your table here is spread. Still afar off, he met us near your son and brought us home. Dying, he lived, he declared your love. Give us grace and open the gate of glory. May we who share Christ's body live in his risen life. We who drink this cup bring life to others. To we whom the Holy Spirit gives light to the world. Keep us firm in the hope that you have set before us. So we and all your children may be free and the whole earth live to praise your name. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Almighty God, Almighty God, we thank you for feeding us with the spiritual food of the most body and blood of your Son, Jesus Christ. To him we offer your souls and bodies to be a living sacrifice. Send us out in the power of your spirit. Go in peace to love and serve the Lord. In the name of Christ, amen. And the blessing of God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit be with you now and forevermore. Amen. First of all, apologies. Believe it or not, it's uh, years since I celebrated communion with two cups, because in Kilmore Diocese they're still using all the single cups, and sometimes in Armagh they have a choice the single cup uh, and the two cups, so I'm out of practice with that and apologise for that. And also the, the hymns sung during the service, but the singing was excellent, so it's no harm to sing an extra hymn anyway. And uh, look forward to seeing you very soon again, hopefully. <laughs> <laughs>